So without further ado, I introduce you and we welcome Dr. Benjamin Lawrence. Thank you so much. Thank you for that very nice welcome. And I'm very honored to be um, launching this uh, new series. We on the board uh, thought it would be a great opportunity for us to try to um, chart a course uh, towards racial and social justice by speaking about the history of Amistad first and connecting it um, with uh, more contemporary issues over the course of time through a series of talks. The first three are gonna focus on uh, the Amistad history. And uh, today I'm gonna talk a little bit about the North American dimensions of the Amistad saga. I use that term because it's a reference to uh, a recent article that I co-authored with my colleagues, Jorge Felipe Gonzalez and Jibril Cole. And um, you've all been provided an opportunity to access that. And if you haven't had opportunity, uh, we'll make sure you get a copy of that in the, in the chat or by email later on. Um, but that was a, a new publication in the Oxford Research Encyclopedia of Latin American History. And it was the first time for the three of us to collaborate. And uh, as we did so, we realized there was a lot more going on in the contemporary dimensions of the Amistad legacy, as well as um, under scrutinized elements of the Amistad history. So today I'm just gonna talk for about uh, 25 minutes uh, at the most, hopefully, um, to allow us to have some questions um, and discussion afterwards. Um, as I mentioned, this is the first part of a three-part series uh, focusing today on the U.S. dimensions, uh, and the future talks will be led um, by Dr. Jorge Felipe Gonzalez uh, to, to discuss the Cuban dimensions of the story, and um, Dr. Jibril Cole will be talking in May about the African dimensions, and I'll mention that again toward the end. But today I want to briefly begin in Sierra Leone because it's really hard to tell the story without uh, beginning where it all starts um, and move quite rapidly across the Atlantic and then focus on what is going on in the United States and why it's so important uh, for understanding um, the story of the Amistad, but also to understanding the legal contours of the story. So many of you are probably familiar with Amistad because you may have seen uh, the 1997 Steven Spielberg film, Amistad, uh, which features uh, a well-known uh, cast of distinguished actors. Um, and at the center piece, in the center there, you see Chiwetel Ejiofor, who is um, a British Nigerian actor, and he plays James Covey. And James Covey is my favorite character in the whole of the Amistad story. And if we have a little bit of time toward the end, I'll tell you a little bit about why. And uh, if you do have questions, please feel free to um, post them in the chat. And uh, one of our board members, Chris Menapes, will be um, moderating Q&A toward the end of the discussion. So the Amistad film that some of you may have seen, and if, if you haven't, it's available on uh, Amazon Prime, and I think also perhaps on Netflix. Um, it's a, a very entertaining, mostly reasonably accurate rendition of the Amistad story. Um, but one of the caveats that I just wanna park and then we'll move on is that the way the Spielberg retelling of the story um, is put together is really uh, a broader story of the transatlantic slave trade. And I think because it's one of the first Hollywood films that tries to tell the story of the slave trade, Spielberg and his his crew um, of writers and actors are trying to capture a much broader story. But the Amistad, however, is not a, really a classic story of the transatlantic slave trade. As, as important uh, as that is, it's actually a very aberrant, a very um, unusual story in the transatlantic slave trade. And that's because the Amistad uh, slave ship uh, that is captured uh, or brought into the US um, in 1839 is actually a coastal ship from Cuba uh, that probably did not actually itself make a transatlantic voyage, although there were some 
dis uh, discussion about that. But also it's because it took place in 1839 when the transatlantic slave trade was entirely illegal. It was going on, but it was illicit. So here I wanna begin with the origins of the Amistad uh, survivors. And I'll call them survivors. Sometimes I'll call them captives. I'll try to avoid calling them slaves because they weren't slaves. They were captured and enslaved, um, but ultimately they won their freedom uh, and they were liberated by the courts and most of them returned to uh, what is today Sierra Leone. So here is modern day Sierra Leone with its capital Freetown and the region that most of the Amistad captives or the Amistad survivors come from is on this map uh, towards the southernmost part of the region of Sierra Leone. And you can see it marked here as the Moa River. Um, you can see the town of Kenema and Kilahun and uh, Zimi. And you can see on the coast on the islands known as Bonth or Bonth, B-O-N-F, B-O-N-T-H. And the region where most of the people who were aboard the Armistead ship um, originate is that part of Sierra Leone. And here is a closer detailed, more contemporary map. It was designed by a, a cartographer uh, and it was part, it's features in my book and it also features on that article online. So you can see it more carefully and you get a better sense of um, the small communities that were possibly the origins of some of the children. And my focus is on, my research focus uh, in that book is on the children's story of the Amistad. So as I said, most of them originate in this uh, relatively lowland region. It's sometimes referred to as the Galinhas, which is a Portuguese word um, referring to chickens because it was a flat grassy land where there were lots of uh, African guinea fowl, um, often referred to as Galinha uh, in Portuguese and, um, and in Spanish. And so that term uh, emerges to be a, a descriptor for the whole region. Uh, and that region um, is marked in a sort of a shaded area here. That is where the majority of the Amistad captives last saw uh, their African homeland before their return later on, several years later. So they embarked or they were um, in, in captured and embarked on a, in a year, and I'm drawing your attention to Lomboko. Lomboko features in the Amistad film, but it's not at all like what features in that film, that film that, that uh, fort in the film is actually from Puerto Rico and there's no fort on Lomboco. It was a small, very low lying island, most likely submerged by the ocean today. And they get aboard uh, a ship, not directly on board a slave ship, but the slave ships during this illegal slave ship period were deep off coast and um, enslaved Africans were put a, aboard very large canoes uh, canoes that could carry upwards of 100 people, two-tier canoes, and they crashed across these very um, dangerous surf uh, to these vessels that were moored far off coast. Uh, they were moored off coast so they could escape quickly from the patrols of the British uh, Navy, but also later on this French and, this, and the US Navy that patrolled the west coast of Africa trying to stop the slave trade during this period of illegality. And uh, because it was an illegal slave, sh sh slave trading period, now I use that phrase advisedly, but I mean illegal insofar as it by international treaty had been banned. But of course we all consider today slave trading illegal, but uh, until, the 18, until about 1820, um, there were parts of the Atlantic uh, where it was uh, particularly the Southern Atlantic where it was still quote unquote legal. Um, but in certainly in 1839, or where this ship probably transported the Africans, 1837, 1838, it was entirely illegal throughout the entire Atlantic region. And so as a result, the slave ships adapted. They created different types of slave ships that were smaller, that often faster, um, and often had secret compartments. And this is actually an illustration of a captured French slave ship that had a different type of configuration to the classic image, indeed the image that you saw on uh, the poster uh, for this speaker series. Um, the classic image of the slave ship um, is not something that was operating in this period, but we'll hear more about that uh, in, the, in the future talks. I wanna bring us uh, quickly to, um, so you understand the journey that was taken by most of the Amistad captives. Um, the Amistad captives begin here in Lomboko on the far right of the map. Um, 
and they sail um, in about probably April 1839, although it's quite likely that there were several different ships um, bringing many of the Africans to Cuba. Um, but the, the ones that um, become part of the US lawsuit uh, were put on board the small ship known as La Amistad in Havana, and it leaves Havana in June 1839. And you can see the estimated journey, um, although it's probably a little bit more um, higgledy-piggledy, until it arrives um, off the coast of Long Island, New York, um, in the late summer. So that's the sort of transatlantic dimension of the trade, of, of the journeys. Um, and this map actually comes from my book. And you can see it's illustrating the children in particular. Um, and they do have slightly different itineraries, but this is just to give you a general sense. This is one of the um, best known images of the Amistad ship from the period. It's a painting that, um, that was done contemporaneously, although it's um, situated in a different um, locale. Um, but it captures um, the type of uh, sloop. Um, it was a copper bottomed low sloop um, and it probably could not house or in, in its, in its um, under the deck more than 50 or 60 uh, adults. So it was a relatively small uh, coastal schooner that was used for primarily for traveling around um, the island of Cuba uh, and it may have been manufactured in the United States. So now I want to move quickly to the uh, uh, mutiny to give you a sense of, or the revolt as it's um, uh, called, uh, to give you a sense of what is really the legal dispute, because now we're moving into the United States uh, narrative. So at some point aboard the ship, uh, the Africans seize control of the vessel and several of the Cuban and probably Afro-Cuban uh, crew are killed by Africans. And um, then the Africans seize control of the ship and they attempt allegedly to sail it back to, uh, to West Africa or to sail back themselves to West Africa. And here you can see a lithograph rendition of this uh, revolt. Now, most African historians and Latin American historians and historians of the Amistad generally today will refer to it as a revolt rather than a mutiny because a mutiny uh, often is used specifically to describe crew who rebel against their leadership. These were not crew, they were enslaved Africans who'd been, who were largely underneath um, in the hull of the ship. Um, although possibly the young children were um, on, aboard the, the deck. Uh, and they seize control of the vessel probably at nighttime, um, results in the death of the captain, the murder of the captain, um, and probably at least two or three other individuals. So today we refer to it as a revolt um, or a slave ship revolt. And there's a lot rich literature, a rich literature of slave ship revolts uh, throughout the transatlantic slave trade period, both the, both the quote unquote legal and the illegal period. Uh, many slave ships uh, experience some form of revolt um, and a number of vessels are captured by Africans during the long history of the transatlantic slave trade. But this is perhaps the most famous one. And it's famous because it arrives um, in the coastal waters of the United States in late, um, in late summer of 1839. Uh, and then the sort of early um, version of the US Coast Guard goes uh, and brings the ship into dock uh, in, uh, in uh, to Connecticut. So it's, it's identified off the coast of uh, Long Island. Possibly the Africans come aboard, come, come to land in, uh, on Long Island, but eventually the ship is brought to, uh, to Connecticut. And in Connecticut, um, a series of legal disputes take place. And this is, a la this is a passage from one of the primary documents that we understand. And this is an answer by the defenders of the Amistad captives. So the main name there is Baldwin. Baldwin was one of the uh, several individuals who spoke before the Supreme Court. And uh, he was one of the, um, he's played by Matthew McConaughey in the movie. And he um, is uh, uh, one of the most uh, outspoken um, uh, supporters of the Amistad captives, uh, but he himself was not known as an abolitionist at this time. He sort of joins the abolitionist camp very quickly. 
And he argues in his, this is what's, what's today referred to as a, um, a response letter, since I'm actually also a law student currently, um, and getting more familiar with the ins and outs of legal disputes. This is actually um, a response to an official charge, right? So the charge is mutiny and murder. And this is the response by Baldwin and his allies that no, indeed, they are natives of Africa and they were born free and they have every right to be free and not to be slaves. And so all of the other claims are null and void. They were unlawfully kidnapped and forcibly and wrongly taken from Africa to Cuba against their will. It's a very, um, by modern parlance, it's a very tautological passage, but it's a very powerful text because it constantly asserts that everything done to the Africans was illegal in every shape and form. So Baldwin is actually um, uh, hired by Lewis Tappan, and Lewis Tappan is a publisher and a, and a, a um, merchant in New York, and he's a leader of um, a group of very um, outspoken and very um, uh, active abolitionists. In this period, abolitionism is not exactly um, uh, the winning camp in New York and Connecticut. Indeed, Connecticut had slavery until 1840. Uh, even though it had an abolition law earlier, there were still people who were legacy slaves, enslaved people. And um, New York had a lot of people that were benefiting from the transatlantic slave trade, the illegal and the legal, and include, and many Connecticut insurance companies insured slavery throughout the South. Uh, and so in this period, there were a lot of pro-slavery people in Connecticut and New York. Ab Indeed, Tappan's house was burned down by a pro-slavery mob. So Tappan and his brother were the leader of a community of people who found uh, Baldwin, and then they also identified Josiah Willis, Willard Gibbs, who was a professor at Yale at the time. Um, he was not a, an expert in African languages, but when he met the Africans in the jail, he was able to describe and document some basic elements of what we today know as the Mende language. And by doing so, he was able to bring, uh, to assemble together a small um, text of numbers and a few other words. And this is, of course, uh, also uh, documented in the film. Uh, so Gibbs, along with some several of his law students, several of his divinity students, go to um, go to the prison, and they speak with Sanke or Sankbe, and they, with his um, very um, simplistic uh, understanding of what is undertaken. Um, he is able to communicate with Saint Bay and others and write down a basic um, set of words in Mende. And during this period, they actually are able to then, um, over the course of time, identify a translator, James Covey, who is aboard a ship in New York. And he himself was actually a rescued child slave. And I've written about him um, extensively, uh, identified indeed the slave ship that he was on before he was rescued and becomes part of the British Navy. And with James, James Covey, they're then able to put together basic biographies of each of the captives who were in detention in Connecticut. And you can see here one page of this document. And it's a remarkable document because it provides us with the type of information about West Africa for this period, life in villages, uh, domestic life, um, uh, data about families and so forth, which we would otherwise never have for this period. So armed with that, and armed with the um, amazing linguistic powers of James Coeli Covey, uh, they are able to document the origins of the African Armistead survivors. And uh, they provide really lucid details about individual aspects of capture, uh, the types of communities they lived in, the names of family members, um, key events, these are all what we would today in an asylum case turn on would become really important because they um, provide a veracity to the claim that these are African born individuals. So before the, legal, the lower court, the key dispute is whether um, these were Africans who had mutinied and murdered, sorry, whether they were slaves from Cuba who had mutinied and murdered, or whether they were kidnapped in Africa and smuggled into the US via Cuba in violation of law with false documents. And so to prove their case, the abolitionist team advances what I call an Atlantic argument. And if you're interested in that, I can provide you with a reference to an article I wrote where I talk about the different dimensions of the Atlantic argument 
that the uh, abolitionists pull together. The key dimensions of that are, of course, understanding the continuation of slavery in Cuba, understanding life on the West African coast, and understanding the persistence of illegal slave trafficking. And they do this in a way that today we would call expert evidence. They bring in experts who either speak in person in the court, or in the case of Richard Robert Madden, a global anti-slavery advocate, um, they bring in a written testimony from him. And in so doing, they're able to convince the court that indeed these are clearly individuals who were born and raised in Africa. And however they may have been enslaved in Cuba, they were kidnapped from Africa. They were not brought to Cuba uh, willfully. They were not immigrants. They were enslaved and kidnapped. And so after they win at that first court level, um, it's appealed to the, what we today call a federal uh, circuit court, um, which simply affirms the decision. And then it is appealed to the Supreme Court. And this is really the substance of the film. And that's the argument that people know most about. But the interesting thing is that the argument before the Supreme Court is, um, is rather narrow in focus. Indeed, um, the appellants, that is the actually led by, led by the Martin, Martin Van Buren, the president at the time, the people who appealed to the Supreme Court never actually challenged the finding um, that these and Africans are free born and were kidnapped. So by a modern legal standard, they would actually have very little uh, scope in the Supreme Court to win their case. You can't simply just not challenge a finding. But in this particular case, what concerned the Supreme Court was not simply whether they were simply free men um, and or whether they were captured and kidnapped, but rather a series of international treaties that the US had, had signed with Spain and whether they were binding and what would happen to these Africans if those treaties were in force. And the US government argued that the Africans were Spanish property and that under uh, the treaties that existed, the court had no authority to challenge this and that they had to be returned to Cuba. And this argument on behalf of the US government raises the ire of abolitionists and it actually brings in um, the former president, John Quincy Adams, um, because he's so furious, she's so furious that the US government would be basically acting as the proxies of the Spanish crown. So before the a Supreme Court in 1840, the decision is 1841, but before the Supreme Court in 1840, uh, Martin Van Buren and, uh, William, and Baldwin, as I mentioned earlier, argue that these treaties no longer apply, that they concerned a period in time when certain parts of the ocean were open to slave trading, but today they are not. There is no precedent that they could turn to uh, uh, that would enable uh, the uh, United States government to take these men and, and some young girls and send them back to Cuba where they would be enslaved and sold and most likely end up working on sugar plantations. Indeed, that these individuals were clearly, as is evidence from the record, free born in Africa and they were kidnapped and smuggled into Cuba in violation of international law. And then they themselves liberated themselves and they had every right to do so. And so by making this argument, um, the winning argument, the Martin, um, John Quincy Adams and the abolitionist team are advocating for two things. That one, that there's no question that these are free born. And indeed, as I said, that was not actually challenged by the appellants for some reason that's a little unclear to me. But most importantly, because they were free, they had the right to do what they want. So the actual district court, the first level court, had decided they need to be returned to Africa at the cost of the US government. The Supreme Court said, no, they're free. And they're free, and therefore they can do whatever they want. Now, as we later know, and as we'll hear in subsequent talks, most of them choose to return to West Africa. Uh, and we'll hear more about that um, in future talks. But now I briefly want to talk about the importance and the legacy of this story, and then we'll um, take some questions if we have some time. Mm -hmm. So this is the replica of the ship that we still have today and that has sailed indeed to Cuba and to Sierra Leone, um, is currently in New England. Um, the legacy of this story is profound. And so in the article that I co-authored, um, which if you haven't read, I invite you to read, we talk about the enduring legacy of the Amistad. And I just want to touch on a couple of elements. 
So the first is our organization, uh, Discovering Amistad, which uh, is devoted not only to telling the story of the Amistad and the legacy of it, but also to promoting uh, social and racial justice in the United States and beyond. And this is not simply a story about Africans um, returning to Africa who have been Africans who've been kidnapped returning to Africa, but it's a story about justice and freedom and their process of self-liberation and their capacity to self-emancipate with an enduring significance for the present day. So our organization takes this ship as our sort of linchpin for a much bigger set of conversations. Uh, and so that's part of uh, the legacy. Another element of the legacy, if you have the fortune to go to New Haven, you can see this sculpture by Ed Hamilton. This was commissioned um, by the Amistad Committee to celebrate an anniversary of the liberation of the Africans. And this is a, a spectacular sculpture. Um, this is Ed in his uh, studio in K Kentucky, a previously um, unseen photograph of him at working on the, the clay um, uh, model for the bronze sculpture. And here you can see one of, image of the, of the sculpture. And if you travel to New Haven, you can do an Amistad tour of the city. And indeed there's an Amistad tour in Connecticut, a bigger tour where you can see all the key historical sites and you can learn about their um, legacy today and the enduring significance of the story. And if you're also interested, there's an opera written by Anthony Davis with a libretto by his sister. Um, it premiered in the Chicago Ly Lyric Opera, and it's been performed subsequently in other parts of the United States. Uh, and there's a recording of the opera, and it takes this profound story and turns it into a remarkable and charismatic uh, rendition of the enduring legacy of Africa and the African diaspora for the history of the United States. So, Again, I wanna just emphasize that my expertise um, is relatively narrow in this regard. My primary focus was on telling the story of the Amistad through the lens of the children, which had not previously been done. Most stories focus on the male narrative and the male adults, particularly saint Bay and others, but there is a different story. And so really what I wanna say here is that the story can be told on multiple registers. There are always new and interesting elements that can be elicited from the story. And in our article, we talk about some of these different dimensions. And in the future, you'll be hearing from Jorge Felipe Gonzalez um, about some of the interesting Cuban dimensions of the story. And also we'll be learning about the Sierra Leone and broadly West African dimensions from Jabril Cole in May. Um, not the least of which is, some of you may be aware, the currency in Sierra Leone features Sangpe, there is a bridge named after the Amistad survivors, um, and it continues to be and have a profound impact in Sierra Leone political history. And so with that, I'd like to uh, thank um, the board for inviting me to speak and I'm happy to take questions.